Don't you love the sound? Don't you love that sound? Because you know what it means. It means every single Friday, every Wednesday and Friday, oh, I'm so sorry, every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, your boy is live right here. Mean if Catholic, it's Paleocrat Diary. <laughs> We're going to have a good one. Oh, that's loud. We're going to have a good one. Oh, you know, I get so lost in that song. It's just true. I get totally lost in it, and I get lost in that comment section. Alex, it's good to see you. I don't know if I'm Jocko Pilled. In fact, let me say this. I saw your description, right? Jocko Willink, is that how you pronounce it? Jocko Willink, retired SEAL, wakes up at 4.30 a.m. at least to get after it in response to every adverse situation with good. Well, you know what? I'm awfully darn close. <laughs> and on Mondays, I'm there because we boys waking up at 4. And every single time, man, I'm getting at it. I'm going after it every single time, every single day. Take a knee for Jesus Christ because he's king. We're going to rejoice, aren't we? We're going to be glad in it every single day because we're here. What a remarkable thing it is just to be alive. And we are sons and daughters of the king of kings. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So howl with me. Come on. Ow! <laughs> yeah. Ah, if you're not over the wolf pack, you got to do it. You got to do it. It's totally pumped up over there. Jay Pernobi, he's in the comments. He's over there. Reed ends. Is it red ends or reed ends? Doesn't matter. Big time heart with that powerful little cross in the middle. And a 100. Very glad to see you. Very glad to see you super pumped. Make sure, if you love the show, and I know you do, it, you know what? It's one of these things, isn't it? That people who listen to the show, it's like they love to hate it, or they hate to love it, or they love to love it. <laughs> but no matter what, there's love involved in the show. You know, they have to. They got love for the Kaiser. <laughs> they got love for the Kaiser. And if you don't understand what that means, you have to go to the Wolfpack, because there were hilarious memes that were made over there. Just absolutely hilarious memes about the Kaiser. I don't even know where that came from. Why? They, well, okay, I guess there's a, a picture that kind of is, you know, I have a number of pictures that have kind of that authoritarian look and feel to it. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it, it, it is true. And so the, people are making memes about the Kaiser and the Kinder. And it was, it's just hilarious. They took a bunch of photos of my family, put on there, what, what was it? Peace, land, and bacon. Is that what it was? <laughs> Peace, land, and bacon. I'm like, that's pretty legit. That's pretty much the uh, Paleocrat Empire. <laughs> and we are expanding. Tim Flanders said so. Tim Flanders said so. It is expanding. It's taking over. It's totally true. Taking over all over the place, including, just as a, a quick reminder, not going into massive detail, except just to say that uh, I'm over at Reason and Theology now on Mondays, Okay. Chilling with Michael Lofton's crew over there. Reason and Theology Mondays, same bat time, same bat, not same bat channel. <laughs> same bat time, different bat channel. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. And I, I got to figure out what I'm going to do. If I'm going to do like, do I want to just continue the series I'm on? Do I want to focus on a different one? I've thought about it. I've thought about it. Thought about doing uh, Secular Age over there. But that, <laughs> imagine, right? I guess I came over here with a bang and said, hey, guys. I'm new over here. Let's go through this 20-part series on the book called Enthusiasm by Ronald Knox. <laughs> and it was awesome, wasn't it? It was awesome. It was a risk. Let your boys into that. Your boys into taking risks, right? And saying, look, I believe in this kind of thing. I think it's good. I think it's good to stay on track. It's good to have focus. It's good to have a vision as to what you got going on. And we need vision, don't we? We do. We need vision right now. Because everything's blurry. We're going to talk about that in today's part two of Father Lasance's uh, manual slash guides for young and old. I've, inc I've incorporated the parenthetical, but it's true to form for the book, right? For young and for old men and women. So we're going to talk about that. But I've thought about going through secular age, but the book, it's gigantic. I mean, I'll show you. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Blam! Blam! Look at this! Look at this bad man jam. What's up, by the way, Benoit? What's up, Haley Luya? What is going on, girl? You know, I'm I'm excited, Haley. Haley is the is the mod over at uh, the prayer chain, right? So it's the Wolfpack prayer chain. 
over on Telegram. She's the mod over there. She's the admin, in fact. She created it. It was, it was, she took the initiative for that. And I'm extremely grateful that she did. Um, and so it's one of those things where I'm really grateful to have her on board. And I know she's a very, very busy person. She doesn't just do stuff with this show. I mean, you've, you've probably seen her all over the place. <laughs> she's, one of, she's one of those people, right? She's all over the place. So you'll see her on diff in different live streams and stuff, and she helps people moderate and everything. But she's a busy woman. And so I just I want to express again, and I, I know I, I say this a lot, but I'm, I'm truly grateful for, for Haley. I'm truly grateful for all the mods. But Haley, you know, I just want to tell you I'm very grateful for you. And, you know, we've talked about the idea of doing prayers during the week, you know, because I'd like to do that. I'd like to do um, different prayers and, and host that in the live chat over there. In fact, I'd like to do it almost every day. I'd like to, to set it up so that we do rosaries and chaplets and novenas and things like that. And I'll, I'll lead it. You know, I'm part of the, the book club, too, over there. We're actually having our first meeting tomorrow at 5 o'clock. That's going to be a live chat over on uh, the... Um, Wolf Pack of the Canine Brigade, okay, or the, the the book club of the Canine Brigade, and all of that stuff is connected to the Wolf Pack chat. So if you just go to the the Wolf Pack chat, all one word. If you go to that on Telegram, you'll see me right <laughs> in the in the fire, right? The it's it, everything's fine here, kind of thing. Uh, in there, you'll see in the info bar, you'll see all the different links to all those different places, including the Resource Center. But check this out. So this book, all right, Charles Taylor, Secular Age. Just look at this. <laughs> ridiculous ridiculous and how many pages is this let's see this batman pajama all the way to the end i i won't include I, you know i won't include the notes i mean I, I could i'm gonna have to go through the notes because some of those are you know some of these guys are just massive uh let's see conversions in secular age let's see here i mean you're talking i thought it was even longer i guess it's not Se only 776 pages <laughs> it's only I mean, that's, that's about the size of enthusiasm but this has more words. It's a much, much, yeah. This has more words per page. Yeah, pretty close though. So I can imagine this being just a, a major time feat. <sighs> we're going to do it. <laughs> I have a feeling that's exactly what we're going to do. Yes. And Haley says, you know, not everybody likes it when she's a mod. You know, but you take care of business. In fact, uh, Ailey had to take care of some business. There was a cat in here last time. You know, I, I'm pretty, aren't I pretty lenient, by the way? with people about, you know, if, if somebody's causing a ruckus, I normally don't mind. I mean, to, truth be told, I was just telling Tim this morning, we were talking about getting a welcoming bot and stuff for different telegram groups and everything. And and I said, you know, you kind of need it, man. You know, he was trying to say that his group's going to function differently <laughs> than the wolf pack. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, you try to control that. <laughs> you try to, he's going to be like, oh, no, he's out of control. And I said, groups on this thing, man, it kind of flows in a way. It kind of flows like, you know, in those movies when you got a teacher at the chalkboard just zoned in, you know, maybe as a, you know, survival mechanism and such. <laughs> and the class is acting crazy, throwing paper airplanes and blowing spit wads at people and everything and running around and all that. And then the bell rings and the teacher turns around. The kids are already gone. That's kind of how the <laughs> how groups work on on Telegram, I think. And, you, you know, you just get to that place. But I I, I uh, sometimes it gets like that over here. You know, you could be talking about something. Like I was talking in the last episode, we got really personal. And we were talking about family and, and my daughter, how she passed away and some of the things that we went through during that time. And I looked down in that comment section and people are just going to town on some weirdo rando. <laughs> arguing with them about stuff that's like, <laughs> why do I even see this? I should turn it off. I should turn it off, you know. Uh, but, but Angela finally just had it with this dude. You know, because he's really one of those weirdos who, th who thinks it's cool that his mission in life, his notion of apologetics and evangelism is that he goes into comment sections with a completely random persona and profile to try to compel people by telling them that they're terrible and barbaric and everything else. That's, you know, it's one of those apologetic methods out of a Cracker Jacks box. But, you know, it's what he does. <laughs> It's kind of like the dude over in the Montanist video I made. There's a guy in there that's insistent that the Pericletos is a man. And I asked him about it. I said, so says, you know, the Muslims and maybe cultists. And he said, I'm not a Muslim. And I said, well, then you're kind of admitting you're a cultist. <laughs> he, he didn't say I'm neither one. He just said he's not a Muslim. You know, and then he goes on this whole thing about, you know, that, that he's Cuban. He's a Cuban-American. And in Cuba... 
everyone would think I'm a clown. And so he doesn't need to, you know, my, my beliefs, I'm just a clown. And I'm like, wow, man. So you're like Cuban American. That changes the entire game. I don't even know how I would deal with this now. <laughs> like, like, oh, well, there's the power. <laughs> I don't mean to be rude. I mean, you know, uh, you know what? So is uh, Marco Rubio. I don't really care. I, you know, I criticize his foreign policy all the time. He can be wrong on a lot of stuff. And so it doesn't really matter, you know, but at the same time, thinking like, you know, what does that have to do with anything? But dude comes back, dude comes back talking about, how supposedly I'm ridiculing him. I don't, I, what, do you, what do you call it when you're like the only guy in the world who has your belief system? I mean, I mean, what do you call that? I mean, it's obviously an enthusiasm this guy has, obviously, okay? Um, and so he got, he got upset. He said, I'll give you a little history lesson. Give you a little history lesson. Uh, just so you know, in case you were unaware, Jesus was a loner. Jesus was, was mocked and ridiculed. And I'm like, you know what? I don't know why you're... you're projecting yourself on oh and he said by the end he said and he ends up being one of the most popular men to have ever lived <laughs> one of them <laughs> name somebody more i don't know <laughs> like you know but it was funny I, I thought to myself number one why is this cat projecting you know what's the point of that like why are you projecting yourself onto jesus i mean for one yeah a little nod there for one our lord was not much of a loner right he liked to go out and pray alone in the morning and he went over you know to the desert by his lonesome and stuff, but he was gallivanting around with 12 dudes and more around that that didn't leave till later when he started dropping the bomb on transubstantiation, right? And then they started leaving. And he had thousands of people following him all the time. He fed them. People wouldn't leave him alone. You know, and, and even when he was alone, half the time he was with his Peter, James, and John. And that's kind of like most people in real life. So he wasn't, it wasn't a loner, but this guy, man, I'm like, but what do you do with folks like that? My whole point of even bringing that up, what do you do with folks like that? You know, to me, I just say let them ride, but sometimes it reaches that point. It reaches that point where finally, finally, you got to let them go. <laughs> and Angela did. Angela was the moderator that day, and she dropped that dude like it was hot. <laughs> she did. She dropped him hard. She dropped him hard. And so, well, I think she put him in a timeout or something. I don't know, but no matter what, you know, as long as, as long as you're pretty cool about stuff, I don't care. I don't care. What I do care about is whether or not you like, comment, share, and subscribe. <laughs> I actually do care about that, okay, I, because it helps. You know, otherwise, you got people just self-promoting all the time. Well, you know, people do enough of that already. And so, you know, make sure if you like the show, if you like it, if you tune in and you say, this is always a lot of fun. I love waking up and, and hearing this guy ramble and stuff and he and he t sometimes when he's on track <laughs> he, he informs us of really cool things you know and we go through books together and it can be a wild ride of emotions where one minute i'm laughing the next minute i'm wanting to you know punch a wall and the next minute i'm crying my brains out with him wanting to give him a hug you know and i, and I walk away learning something new i learn a way I, I walk away being being deeper in my faith whether it's the interviews whether it's the books he's covering if that's the kind of thing you like then throw me a bone. <laughs> Go ahead, push like right now. Push like and push share. And you can push share, copy it, paste it around. I don't care where you share it. In fact, it'd be kind of cool if people started sharing some of this on Pinterest. I guess that supposedly helps. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not on Pinterest. I'm not on Pinterest. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have the the Pinteristas in the comment section. They're gonna be like, "What? <laughs> You're not on Pinterest? Like it's got the best recipes." And I'm like, "I'm sure it does." <laughs> Sure it does. My wife would know. My wife would know that. So, all right. Look, we, we can't go forever um, jabber John because we got a lot to talk about. But before we do, I just want to tell everybody, Saint Maker, you got to go check it out. The link is in the description below. I still have not heard back. They, they're, 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 they've called a meeting, right? They've called an official meeting. The tribe has come together and they begin analyzing things and looking at critiques and suggestions and they're going to get back with me okay and when they do i shall let you know i will relay that message to you uh but in the meantime just know that even visiting the even visiting the affiliate page in the comment section in order to just see it and determine if it's something that's for you uh, that that even helps just that just that by itself and so i'm very grateful for everybody who has gone, and it helps you, okay? It helps you because I'll tell you, there's a lot of people who go, well, I don't know. I've heard that. 
I've heard it. I've seen it around. Other people are pitching that thing, and now he's pitching it. And you go, you know the reason why? It's not because those people are loaded and they're doling out tons of bucks to anybody. It's because it's an extremely good product. It just is. I've showed, I've showed it before. I've talked about it before. The way that it lays out your day, the way that it lays out months ahead, the way that it's put out in different seasons, the way that every single night has an examination of conscience that you can go through and look at, at the goals and plans that you had, the virtues that you were trying to, to uh, draw out, right? Asking God to instill and infuse within you. And you're trying to work these things out in your life to flesh them out in real time and space that you can write down. Did you do a good job or maybe did you fail today? <laughs> and if you did, it's okay because there's tomorrow, okay? And, but it's according to plan. It's not like kicking the can down the road. And so it's one of those things that says you, you, can, you can keep track of your progress or your regress. Extremely helpful. You got to go check it out. We're going to do this uh, promo real quick. Come right back. And then we're going to be getting to the main stage where we're going to talk about Father Lassance in part two of our series. And today we're going to talk about he's still on apologetics, right? Um, kind of. And <laughs> I know there's going to be people who are going to hear this and they're going to get grumpy at me. They're going to say, well, this isn't what I'm thinking of when I say apologetics. And I'm like, yes. And look around the world at you. You can, you can probably find a bazillion Catholic people who have basic ideas about the unmoved mover. There must be a first cause, you know, uh, there must be meaning or else we don't have, you know, what's the point of anything going on today? That sort of a thing. You can find that the Jesus was a real person. Most people don't deny that. It was quite successful, in fact, <laughs> as an apologetic for a long time. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter to most, most people anymore. They would readily admit that he exists. They'd probably show you some kind of half-cocked image of him that was drummed up by folks at the BBC. It makes him look a little bit like a Neanderthal. They don't, they don't care about our iconography. They don't care about it at all. And so, you know, I look at the world now and I go, this is looking wicked bad. We're going to talk about it. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. So here we go. Same maker. We'll be right back right after this with more Paleocrat Diaries on this Friday, November 5th edition on Meaning of Catholic. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself. But in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though. So head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. You got to do it. It's totally awesome. Right there, thesaintmaker.com slash Paleocrad Diaries. All right. Ah, there's that sound. And you know what that means. When you hear that, it's the alarm. It is the alarm here at Paleocrat Diaries, alerting people all around the world to the four corners of the earth that your boy is about to enter the danger zone. Your boy is about to enter the octagon of history to study some of the greats, right? To sit on the shoulders of giants, those people that have gone before us. Some of them, many of them, both thus far, are should be saints. We gotta start the cause. We gotta start the cause for Ronald Knox. We gotta start the cause for Father Francis Xavier Lassance. We gotta do it, why? Because look at the people that their lives have impacted. Gigantic. 
gigantic, enormous, historic, transgenerational. Impact down to the heart, to the bone and the marrow. They gotta be saying this. We gotta work on it, folks. <laughs> we gotta work on it. But today, we're gonna be talking about this. The manual for boys. And the manual for girls. The guide, the manual. However you wanna play it, doesn't matter. Truth is, jam-packed with information. Jam-packed, and not just information on how to do good in your life, right? Not just information about how to do good in your life and oh, these are instructions for work and for play, for amusement and for prayer. No, 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 no. He has, in t the whole end of it is nothing but novenas, order of mass, methods of hearing mass, including, including the one that people didn't believe existed, that I have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt is in fact true. And it's why I use it all the time. It is Father Lassant's indulgence method of hearing mass. Every single prayer indulgence to the teeth. <laughs> Every single one. Okay, rocking it out. And it lays it out what the indulgences are, how it needs to be done, which Pope gave them. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic stuff. So we're going to do that today. And, oh my gosh, I almost forgot. I did this, I have to let people know, I have to let people know, it's part of the agreement, I didn't realize, I forgot, I do my show at 10, but I'm drinking some beer. <laughs> I'm drinking some beer while we do it. One, <laughs> one, because I'm part of Exodus 90, I got an Exodus 90 crew that, that I have going on, and so the thing is, you're not supposed to be drinking beer. Now I made this, I, I talked to these folks here before that, it took a while for them to mail it. Took a while for me to get it, but I got the package. And so I had to make it, I had to make a deal where basically on Wednesdays and Fridays when I do the show, and now on Mondays, when I do the show, I have to add an extra discipline to keep with the spirit, if not the letter of the law, with Exodus 90. But here's the thing: this one, description of a portion of the beers that we make at Tridentine Brewing, included in this package, and or the magnet for the brew. This is the Habsburg Vienna Lager and check it out. Now, I got it before they were even able to put the, the label on it, right? So I got, I got a handwritten message, <laughs> and I popped the top before we started. <laughs> I popped the top, because last time, it was foam everywhere, wasn't it? Wasn't it? It was foam all over. I was like, oh. <laughs> slurping, <laughs> doing that. Oh, help me, <laughs> I was. I was begging for help. Angela, help me. That's what I was saying. This one says, sorry for Habsburg not being labeled at the time of me putting this rare pack together, or care pack. It's rare, too. It's rare, too. You get the idea with the magnet, though. It's Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Let's see. How would you probably... Uh, oh, I didn't even notice this. On the back of the magnet. Look at this. What is that? How would you pronounce that? I don't know if you can even read that. Can we get it even closer? No, it just gets all... It's all terrible. Is it is it Braciare ad, ad majorum uh, de glorium? My Latin's struggling, guys. <laughs> I'm not like my kids. I never got to go to a classical Catholic school. I never got to go to a classical Catholic school. We never studied Latin. I never I never knew anything about Latin all growing up. So it's only been through the Latin Mass and hearing priests say it and stuff. And so, ah, uh, but this beer, I'll tell you, it's absolutely amazing. You want to know more about it? You can go back into the, the last episode, the previous one, where I introduce it, I talk about it, I even show a picture of the brewers there and their brewery. And it is, it's pretty much confirmed, right? It's settled. We just need to figure out a time and day. That's it. Uh, a date and time. But it's pretty much settled that I'm going to be going down there. Your boy and the Paleocrat Diaries Team Tiny Dancer crew is going to be going down there to their brewery. It'll be their new one because they're moving into a different house. Okay? So they're moving into a different house. And when they get there, it'll probably be January, which is good because by that time, I, I, I will drink beer while I'm there. And we'll do videos. I'll bring my camera, even my lighting and stuff. And that way we can we can do interviews with them, try to make them cinematic, you know, very nice and pleasant and stuff like that. And so uh, maybe we can even coordinate it so that I can go to Mass with them. Our family can go to Mass. So we'll figure it out. But it's going to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. So I'm going to drink this now. I don't know. How do I, how do I feel about... How do I feel about these... Uh, the Vienna Lagers. I don't know. I don't know. We're gonna find out. Hold on a second. Oh, 
That is divine. <laughs> that is divine. I'm not even the biggest lager fan in the world. I'm not. I, you know, I, I'm a stout guy. I'm an imperial stout guy. Imagine that. <laughs> the Kaiser's imperial. You're like, oh, come on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The Kaiser likes his imperial stouts. That's just the truth. But boy, oh boy, oh boy. Mm. Last thing. I got to show you this. Check this out. Oh, and it means right here, the full phrase attributed to St. Ignatius uh, is for the greater glory of God and the salvation of humanity. Yes. Oh, come on, man. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? I love it, man. I need to learn how to pronounce it better. I'll have my kids help me. They're pretty good about that. But check this out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Straight to the dome, boys and girls. Straight to the dome. Mm. All right here. Let's see. All right, yep, last thing in the comments. Andrew Stahl, happier than George Jones on a John Deere. It's finally a Friday. Yes, buddy. It's totally true. It is totally uh, Friday right now. <laughs> That's an astute observation. By the way, speaking of an astute observation, maybe you have noticed the amazing wolf up above me. <laughs> I used to have that behind me when I was using the green screen back when I was uh, doing five days a week on Holy Faith Media. Oh, man, I love that bugger. I haven't used them in a while. I haven't used them in a while. I can, but I, I can take them off. Watch this. Because they might get distracting. It might get distracting. It's all got that. Man, it's just so black. So look at all the white on the screen now. We're going to do that. It's a sneak peek, though. Check it out. Me and Catholic reason and theology. Yeah, boy. <laughs> yeah, boy is there. Both places. All right. Beginning. Okay. Christian apologetics. It's kind of a smattering. Right. This is taken from a couple different sources. Christian apologetics. A verbal defense, speech and defense, is a branch of Christian theology that defends Christianity against objections. Um, and then you've got here, let me see here. Let me get to this, this Bible verse. I actually have my Knox. I could just read it on the screen, but it's so small. I would, I would prefer not to, actually. I would prefer not to. Okay, and so we're going to go ahead and we're going to find, we're going to find this passage here. All right. 3.15, right here. It's okay. We're going to start in a word, okay? We're going to start with verse 8. This is uh, 1 Peter 3, okay? And here's my here's my hardcover edition of the Knox. I think it's a 1950-something. What, what, what year is this? I have, I have a note in here to Patty with all my love from Anne. Yeah, it's got a little poem in there, too. This is 1959. This is the third edition, Okay. But starting with verse 8, right? In a word, think the same thoughts, all of you, and share the same feelings. Be lovers of the brethren. I would see you tender-hearted, modest, and humble, not repaying injury with injury or hard words with hard words, but blessing those who curse you. This God call, God's call demands of you, and you will inherit a blessing in your turn. Yes, long life and prosperous days. Who would have these for the asking? My counsel is keep thy tongue clear of harm and thy lips free from every treacherous word. Neglect the call of evil and rather do good. Let peace be all thy quest and aim. On the upright the Lord's eyes ever looks favorably. His ears are open to their pleading. Perilous is his frown for the wrongdoers. And who is to do you wrong? If only what is good inspires your ambitions. If, after all, you should have to suffer in the cause of right, yours is a blessed lot. Do not be afraid or disturbed at their threats. Enthrone Christ as Lord in your hearts. If anyone asks you to give an account for the hope which you cherish, be ready at all times to answer for it. But courteously and with due reverence, what matters is that you should have a clear conscience so the defamers of your holy life in Christ will be disappointed in their calumny. It may be God's will that we should suffer for doing right, better that than for doing wrong. A lot of times when people talk about apologetics, they focus on the part, right? In, uh, what is it? Verse 15. If anyone asks you to give account of the hope which you cherish, be ready at all times to answer for it. Okay, the hope that you have in Christ Jesus, 
Be ready at all times to give to give an explanation, to give a reason for your hope. And and oftentimes that that gets lumped in with an academic endeavor, which is very important. It's very important. But most of the people that he's writing to, that's wouldn't have even been able to grapple too much with a lot of that. Most of them were practical people. Most people are. They're practical. They're not academically minded. And they've got their reasons, but their reasons, when we, when we think of reasons, sometimes it's like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the unmoved mover. People say, well, there's an unmoved mover. Let me reason my way to this and show you how this works. That's all well and good. It's quite true, in fact. But some people's reasons could be simply that they wish to die a good death. They wish to live a happy life. They wish to be at peace in the truth and, and to know that even if they aren't aware of everything in the world and they haven't studied all the big books, that they can rest assured in an institution that they believe is infallible and for good reason. That they can have a king with a kingdom that doesn't die or that they can see their loved ones on the other side. And people within each of those things would be something that we would debate in apologetics, right? Is the, is the soul immortal, right? Is there an afterlife? How do you know that the church is infallible? And that's where, that's where the academic dynamic comes in. But I think that modern people, that we've become beholden. We become beholden, even the, the Johnny Q and Sally Sue's, in this grand democratization of, of everything, right? In this grand leveling of everything. That we have access to the books, that we have access to the debates, that we have access to the forums. The forums, in fact, are now in our pockets. They're no longer in academia. They're no longer reserved for, you know, a, a, a parish hall or anything like that. They're now in our pockets. We carry them around all the time. And it's not just reserved for people that you're face-to-face -face with. As I said, it's in your pockets. It's not even for people that you could know by name. So often it's a bunch of rando Annans. People, people that hide behind phony pictures for fear of their true identity coming out. All the while folks like me and Tim and Taylor Marshall and other people, right? People way bigger that they're able to use their actual faces and names. You know, and so like the thing is though, is that, that a lot of everyday folks who are not trained academically trained in any significant way have taken it upon themselves to assume that the apologetic endeavor is strictly what they think of when they watch YouTube videos of apologists debating, let's say, Protestants or apologists debating atheists. And they say, that's apologetics. That's true, but not entirely. Not entirely because its function is both to fortify the believer against personal doubts and to remove the intellectual stumbling blocks that inhibit the conversion of unbelievers. I like the ordering of that, by the way. I like the ordering of that. I mean, think about it. You know, you've got, you, you've got it set up in such a way, if you ask most people, what's apologetics? People would say it's defending the faith. And you'd say, well, what's the purpose of that? To lead people to salvation. You go, what do you mean by that? Oftentimes it's within the framework of unbelievers and how we address unbelievers. And like so many other things in our world right now, we've got it completely backward. We just do. Look, look, look at the context, by the way, of, of what we just read. How does he start out? It doesn't start out with provide a reason for it. In a word, think the same thoughts. One holy Catholic apostolic church. Think the same thoughts, all of you. Share those feelings. Be lovers of the brethren. Tender-hearted, modest, humble. Isn't it convenient that we leave that out? So often when we think of this, when we think of engaging in the apologetic endeavor, how many of us think about the idea of being tender-hearted or modest or humble? Seriously. Not, be, not repaying injury with injury. Wow, think about that. How often have we repaid injury for injury that we feel slighted? How many times do we, do we go on a social media platform, right? 
You go on there, you go on Facebook, and you post something, and somebody comes at you, and you feel injured by that. And so what do you do? You attack back and you injure, not in a playful way, not in a way that's like, okay, I'm telling the truth, and it's, it, there's room for this too, but in a way that's like, you know what? You, and I used to do this all the time. In fact, I had a phrase for it. I said, if you want to be the kind of person that slings potato salad at me from across the room, I'm going to take the entire, the entire huge bowl, and I'm going to pour it over your head right in front of everybody. That's bad. That's not good. Not repaying people hard words with hard words, but blessing those who curse you. It reminds me so often, you know, how, how often do we read the saints and we tell people to read the saints and, and you, you know, you read it and then you kind of wonder, you know, did, did that person ever read this book? <laughs> you know, like, were, they, were they ever really reading that? I get that all the time when I read St. Francis de Sales, when I read his, his uh, Devout Life, right? When you read the introduction to the Devout Life and you read that and you read about, let's say, for example, um, vain talk and rash judgments, right? And then you say, I'm going to go to a bunch of YouTubers that have, in, have encouraged me to read this book and I'm going to find out, you know, are they doing the rash talk thing? Are they? I've said that I think every every person who does this work should read that and, and revisit it, maybe as a commitment. Maybe there should be some kind of a form that lays it out and says, I commit to this endeavor. And you just go down the line and say, yes, check it off. And see how you do. Buy a same maker. <laughs> Include it in your same maker and see how you do. And, and, you know, just as a, a word of warning, some people will go, yeah, well, but then you turn the, the camera off and you go, it didn't cause, it didn't cause St. Francis to stop writing to the folks of Geneva. And he wrote in a way, sometimes it was quite biting, but it was urgent. And he dedicated the entirety of his work to love. Where he says right here, he says, uh, my counsel is keep your tongue clear of harm and your lips free from every treacherous word. Neglect evil. How, you know, this is all part of giving, of, of giving a reason for the hope that you have. But do good. Let peace be all thy quest and aim. Every single one of these things is giving a reason. On the upright, the Lord's eye looks favorably. And you could say it. So if somebody gives you a reason. Why do you, why do you believe that? Why, why do you live this way? Why do you embrace that? Because the Lord's eye looks favorably on people who do good. And his eyes are open to their pleading. Perilous is his frown for the wrongdoers. And that would really suck. <laughs> and I've been there before. And his frown is not awesome. It's dreadful. And who's to do you wrong? If only what is good inspires your ambitions. There will still be people. There will still be people, but it gets back to that Jocko pill thing earlier. That something tough comes, you say, good. It's okay. They came after Christ, right? They did to him stuff that they would never do to anybody else. Nobody will endure that. He uniquely endured something absolutely wicked. And that's why I told somebody recently, a friend, a friend. I told a friend who was going through a hard time. I said, you know, let it all out. You know, shake your fists. Cry out to heaven. Get super ticked. And yeah, somebody's got to ban. I'm, I'm banning this person. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a, yeah, we're banning you, buddy. We're banning you. Remove you. Report you. Thank you. Report. There we go. Okay. We'll satisfy your wishes online? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, where, where's my where's my staff, by the way? Where's my secretary on this? <laughs> Haley's like, Angela, help. Angela, help. Here we go. I'm sorry to do that to you, Haley. I know you said you never would, but it's me. It's me. Okay. You're already an admin. <laughs> You're already an admin. And I heard what you said about recently in the Wolfpack, talking about, you know, you, it was somebody you wanted to get rid of, 
but you thought about me and you said, you did some breathing <laughs> and you said, I'm going to do it. If Angela's not there, take care of that business. Okay. There you go. So, all right. Enthrone Christ in your hearts. If anyone asks you to give an account, so you're already enthroning Christ. Okay. You're already enthroning Christ in your heart. And then you give a reason. Does it say, you know, does it say, go online and learn a bunch of arguments? I'm so sick and tired of that. I'm so sick and tired of it. So is my son over there. He's really mad about it. <laughs> he's like, he's like, no, it doesn't say that. It doesn't tell you to just deal with the arguments. It tells you to enthrone Christ in your heart. It tells you to do good. It tells you to avoid evil. And in doing these things, God will smile upon you. God will hear you. He will not frown on you. These are reasons for the hope that you have. More than an abstract argument, more than an abstract argument regarding an unmoved mover. And to be quite frank, most people in the universe know that. They already know. They know. They, when they say that they don't need an unmoved mover, they are lying through their teeth. And why? Because they are suppressing the truth for a lie. Allow Paul to describe them. Allow Romans 1 to describe them for you. God put the setting. The setting's all there. They are left without excuse they're left without excuse. But it's really about the apologetics of the heart that says, and, and look, nowadays, we, we're, we're all sorts of backward. We are part of the problem. If, if, if our idea, we look at the world and we say, look at all the wickedness in the world. Look at all the people who've walked away from the church. I need to find arguments that bring those people back. They're not leaving because of arguments. They're leaving because of sin. And don't take it from me. Don't take it from me. <laughs> Reason and theology. Excited to have Paleo Crad on Monday. Come on, bro. Come on, dude. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Yeah. Dude, I'm going to be making some shorts for you too, bro. <sighs> yes, we are in this. It is the start of something good, my friend. It is the start of something good. And yeah, people are excited to see us join forces, dude. You know, we got amazing power rings. <laughs> We're like, blam! It's like just explosions of awesome. That's what's happening, brother. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Right? Talking about, he begins, when, when in talking about apologetics, he begins talking about the, the reign of Christ. And not just the reign of Christ, but the authority and the infallibility of the church. How, why can we believe in that? Why start there? Why start there? I dig it. I, I dig it because he's an authority guy, because he understands that at the base of it all, we can talk about the fruits all day long, but when you get down to the roots, a network of assumptions that people make, it comes down to a question of by what authority, by what standard are you making these, these claims? And if that is your standard, by what authority are you saying that that standard has universal application? Why does it apply to me? In other words, it's that journalistic question that says, why should I care? Whoop-dee-doo, you like chocolate, I like vanilla. Whoop-dee-doo. You know, I, I like waiting for Guffman, you hate mockumentaries. That's sad for you, but whoop-dee-doo, okay? But why is that relevant to me? But that's how he starts. And he says that it represents in a living, in a living manner. Okay, so it's not just simply, it's not just simply something that's like, well, it's like a book. It's like the Sola Scriptura thing that, that uh, Protestants have. And there's Catholics that act that way. They don't care if it's a living magisterium. They don't care if it's alive, that we can literally see these people that it matters that they are physical. It's just an abstraction. That's, that's in total defiance of St. Francis de Sales. 
in his in his call to to the people of Geneva, and that that's why that's why you know a lot of these rad, bad trads. Let me take that back because I'm I'm accepting some rad trads, but you can go from rad trad to bad trad. You can go to that in a jiffy, right? Super dupe quick, and that's why so many of them could should get Protestant apologist of the year award. A lot of the bad trads. They're literally just the, the gift that never stops giving. <laughs> <laughs> to the people who are wrong and not not gifts as in like this is good for you but gifts as in you know an extra helping of some poison <laughs> here is a, here's a box of rattlers for you it kills the person handling them injures maybe even kills them and it can hurt the people that the weirdos are slinging the rattlers at. <laughs> Whipping it around saying, I got this from a city. <laughs> You're like, whoa, buddy. Freaking me out there, champ. What a weirdo. But he, he talks about, he talks about Lasans here. And, and I'm sorry, I should have put it at the bottom. Father Lasans, I'll do it for the next episode, I promise. I'll have it at the bottom. Father Lasans, uh, the guys for young men and women. Okay, I'll even have a link in below that people can find it. Um, but I love that he begins with this. And why does he begin with the church? Because he talks this way. Calm when fiercest storms prevail. See the ship of Peter sail. Still unharmed from age to age. Through wild winds and storms may rage. Fashioned by a hand all wise. Hell's worst onslaught she defies. I need to get some bifocals. <laughs> I need to get my vocals. I got to keep taking them off like this. Uh, 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 uh. I'll do it. I'll pull them down like this so I can read it. So no matter what, no matter what, what comes our way and why does that matter? Because fresh enemies arise. Heresy arcs appear. They strive to rob the church of the true faith or at least to falsify it. We talked about that in our series on enthusiasm. At first, they counted a great number of adherents. They endeavored to found churches of their own. But the protection and blessing of the Savior was not with them, but with his own church. Hence, their work came to nothing. Thus has it ever been, down to the present day, and thus it will continue to be until time shall be no more. This is, this is a, a, a level of certainty that he has, that he believes that we should be able to embrace this should be unshakable, completely unshakable. He says, all who repudiate or attack the faith of the church cast themselves headlong into the raging billows of a stormy ocean and cause their own destruction upon the rock of the church. Yes, and I, they cause their own destruction. How? Just simply under the waves? In part. Not simply, in part destruction upon the rock of the church it's why it can crush them it's a mountain that can crush yes verily the church is a rock in mid-ocean and this rock is indestructible you can't destroy it so when you're when you're living when you're living your life not just arguing when you are living your life okay and you are striving to do the apologetics of the heart that says I'm making, I am making a, a case all the time. I'm dealing with the doubts. Imagine, imagine yourself being one of those people who's constantly doubting, constantly your mind saying, "Did it really happen this way? Should I really pray today? Do I need to really do my evening prayers? Do I really need to do examination of conscience? Do I really need to go to confession for this? Do I really need to anything in the world? Do I really need to?" It's a haunting thing, isn't it? Isn't it regular? Isn't it common? I mean, in the comments, seriously, isn't it a common thing? Or am I out here in La La Land by myself? <laughs> I might be. I might be there, folks. That are like, this guy's nuts. This guy's off his head. He's off his rocker. Maybe for the Lord. I mean, you know, no doubt about it. In the Wolf Pack, I love the Wolf Pack. I'm not gonna lie. And of course, the biggest one, Team Tiny Dancer, and my mega hot half Korean. Beauty queen wife, Angela. You know, 
But but if we're dealing with that, the apologetic that, that I'm talking about, the first and foremost one is the one that preserves yourself in those moments of doubt. Because that doubt is venomous. It needs to be subject. I, I love how we have to cast down every thought and imagination that rises itself up against the Lord. Thoughts and imaginations, it's easy to think of other people like, oh, yeah, those people over there making that argument. It starts with you. It starts with me. That's, that's who it starts with. We have to cast down those within ourselves. And one of the easiest ways to do it is to recognize that the promise that Christ gave us regarding the infallibility of the church, the indefectibility of the church, that it will go on even to the consummation of the world. It follows that the college of the apostles, that is the church in her office as teacher, must continue to exist through all centuries. And that there would be a spirit of truth to ever abide. And that that teacher will teach us all things. It's why I emphasize over and over again the simplicity of the act of faith, especially in our modern world. So Lassance asked, how can those be right who assert that the church can, can make mistakes? Right? Or that it already has. For in that case, the spirit of truth would have departed from her. The promise of Christ would not be fulfilled and his divinity would be at the end, be at an end. Let him who can overthrow this argument, right? Let him who can overthrow it. And he says that there's another reason why. And of course, we all know this, right? That the gates, the gates or the power of hell shall not prevail against the church. In some ways, I'm preaching to the choir, right? In some ways, I'm preaching to the choir, who in this chat room doesn't believe that? Raise of hands. Who in the chat room has wondered if it's true right now with the Pope that we have right now? <laughs> how, many have, how many have wondered if it's true of Vatican II? Raise your hands. I don't care if you're in front of people. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with the world. Everybody knows anyway. You're probably talking about it. Imagine that jabber jaws are listening to my show. <laughs> they're like, they're like, you know, the haters are like, he talks all the time. And I'm like, so do my listeners. <laughs> they're constantly talking all the time. Oh no. Mm. I got beer. <laughs> I got beer. What am I doing? What am I doing? Yeah, man. The Habsburg, the Vienna, uh, And so people wonder. And you can see in here, yeah, okay, people can say, oh, look, the Pope is evil. Yes, I've wondered. Okay, okay, do you believe that that, that, that wait, I'm not asking that. I'm not asking that. I didn't ask if he's evil, if he's done a bad thing. I'm asking if the promise of Christ that the gates of hell should not prevail against the church and that that applies to the the uh, the College of Bishops, it it, the, it it applies to the magisterium, the one that we can see, okay, as a whole. That mysterious interplay between people who are people who can be misled and a church that cannot. Do you have people wondered whether or not we are at a place right now where maybe maybe the Pope is just a raging heretic and maybe, you know, it's the gates of hell, in fact, have prevailed and we're just in the end times waiting for Jesus to zoink us out. Yeah, webcam HD, we got to get that person gone. We get to this place, though, don't we? We're on the one hand. Look, Michael often did a great video one time. Oh, he does them all the time. But he, he had a great video recently where he's talking about, you know, you, you need to, talking about a, a trad talking to a Protestant. You need to come to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is where it's at. You need to have a Pope. You don't have a Pope. You can't settle disputes. You're just left to the opinion of one person over the opinion of another regarding a text. You need to come back. 
and the person responds back something about the Pope, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we don't, you know, <laughs> we don't listen to him. We don't listen to him in his teaching office. No, no, no. There's a serious cognitive dissonance there. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. That's oil and water. It is. It's oil and water. And it makes no sense. In fact, it makes a laughing stock of Catholics. Because the Protestant could say, oh, so you don't need you don't need a Pope. You don't have a Pope that can that can uh uh deal with the the issues of the day that come your that come the way of the church, and he's no longer binding in heaven, you know, binding on earth and in heaven. He's not doing the key thing anymore. And all we got now, what is it? We got Trad over here and Trad over there debating over the interpretation of various texts. For example, the Feeney, the Feeney controversy, the Feeney controversy, and you say in, in the Sede world, it, it ravages their communities it, big time. I've seen cops called in, ask people to see MRI, and so you know you have these major time, major time debates over it, and each side they're getting together all of their proof texts, and they're saying, but the Pope wrote this. And they go, the saints wrote that. The catechism said this. This catechism said that. And they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And yet, what are we, what are we promised? What is the promise of Christ? What is it? He only mentions the church specifically a couple times. And what does he say? You got a problem with your brother? Talk it out. If it doesn't work, and often it does not, especially in a debating church, what do you do? You get your boys together. You get your girls together. You have yourself a little, you know, hoedown, <laughs> and you debate it out, and then it gets to that point where if it's if it's a matter of urgency, where it's it's requiring the attention, that it comes to their attention, and all of a sudden, bada boom, bada bing, bada boom, bada bing, where does it go? It goes all the way up to the ladder to Papa. Without Papa, we're in some serious trouble. We're in some serious trouble. That's why, yeah, Benoit says too many people are playing a dangerous game online and elsewhere criticizing the Pope and the church while, ca while claiming to be the real faithful Catholics. And these folks, look, they need to go back and watch, don't they? They should watch the Enthusiasm series. Should they not? Can I get a clap? Can I get a clap? We all did that, guys. <laughs> we all did it! Nobody else online. I, I didn't see anyone else online that did a chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of that book. Zero. And we went through and we showed not only the stories and all that, but how it applied to today. But these are the promises of Christ. And why make errors that people have already made? What's the point of that? What is that? Let me see here. I think we've made our point about this, right? Ah. You know, so, so, but there's a kind of indifferentism that we're dealing with, isn't there? There's kind of an indifferentism. How do we get that cat off? How do we, how do we ban that specific person? You know what? I am really glad that I've got you on here today, Haley. <laughs> you are rocking it right now. Because I'm seeing in the comments, I'm seeing what that person's posting. What a sicko, by the way. And isn't this exactly ideal? You say, look, from the very beginning, the world is filled with sickos. The world is completely filled with sickos. Yeah, we need to put that person on the actual banned list. I don't know if we can even do that. Or if it's, it's just, just a bot. I'm, I'm letting you ladies to it. Keep on it. Knock that cat out of the park. Yeah, mass report them. Right, but you have this kind of 
you have this kind of indifferentism, and it's amazing that at the time he was he was ta- he was writing this, he was saying that indifferentism you can hear it pop up every once in a while, and that it was shocking. That it was shocking. And that, and that, you know, you would sometimes hear young people, maybe maybe 18 to 20, they would talk this way about a religious indifferentism. They talked about, well, if they just simply, you know, live a good life, that's all that matters. And look at where we are now. He said, it is doubtless the will of the Savior that all nations should accept his saving religion from the time of the apostles and their immediate successors until the end of the world. Hence, it is also his will that all nations should listen to the Roman Catholic Church since she alone bears the true marks of the true church of Christ. It's therefore impossible that it should be a matter of no moment to him whether her teaching should be adopted or not. How false and foolish is the saying, live right, then believe what you like. Tell me, how would you answer anyone who declared that it does not matter whether one has feet or not? If only one can walk... (laughs) Don't you love that, by the way? Yeah, how would you how would you deal with that? How would you deal with a person who says, look, it doesn't matter if you have feet or not, as long as you're walking. As long as you're walking. But see, even then, even then, these arguments right here, people now, and it, it, at the time he wrote this, the social imaginary, and this is why social imaginary is important, because it affects apologetics. It affects apologetics. That if someone says, well, look, how can you walk if you don't have legs? Someone say, here, here's a video of somebody walking around with no legs. They actually use their hands. Or, you know, look at the, look at the dogs that don't have legs. They, they have those little scooters. They'll, they'll, throw, they'll throw back on something and say, look, we've adapted to this. But it wasn't available to his social imaginary at the time. So it didn't affect his apologetic. But Mark, this dear, it's kind of it's kind of like the idea that we needed to, you know, because there's a positive side to this too. Like if your apologetic does an excellent job for a long time, then it will become the the way that the counter apologetic has to deal with it is going to be to, you know, kind of adapt, right? So if, if you make the case that in fact Christ did exist. And you say, there was a man named Jesus. We have enough historical evidence that there is a man, in fact, named Jesus. And you're not going to have a whole bunch of mythicists. You will have people who do believe, like Bart Ehrman, for example. Reza Aslan, right? The, he, he believes in that Jesus was a real guy. He just believes he was a rebellious prophet and stuff. A revolutionary. So a lot of people believe it. Maybe he was a good teacher. And that's the end of that. But mark this, feet are not more necessary for walking than is faith in a life which is to be counted upon, uh, counted upright in the eyes of God. Faith is the rock of an upright life. It is not a matter of indifference to a tree, and I like this, whether its roots, oh, oh no, did I mess it up? Whether its roots are in good soil or not, right? Right? <laughs> I, I don't. I, I must have had it out of order, right? Must have had it out of order. So it must. It must. It's not a matter of indifference. Yeah, whether it's without roots or whether it's got roots and whether it's in bad soil, it actually matters. And that is why. That is why I'm a roots kind of guy. That's why I'm always talking about first things first. That's why I'm saying, I'm telling people we need to stop playing footsies with ourselves and footsies with unbelievers. When we, when, when we have doubts of ourselves, we need to address that first things first, going back to the source. By what standard? By what authority? When, when we talk to other people, by what standard? By what authority? How can you even make sense of the world at all? How can you even be arguing with me at all? How do you even account for things like logic? Abstractions, for example. How do you, how do you uh, involve things like freedom? Uh, wh- where do you even get the idea of an objective, universal moral standard? 
You preach like it, and they can say, well, we, we don't believe that. And you say, well, you sure, you sure as heck preach like it. You're willing to, to send people over with guns in order to enforce that. And it's not commonsensical. I'm sorry to tell you, it's just simply not. Because some stuff that's commonsensical to us is not, in fact, self-evident to somebody else. Ask people who believe or disbelieve in our list in the Bill of Rights. In fact, ask the popes in the past if, if some of those things that were deemed self-evident are, in fact, self-evident. Our popes would disagree. Or at least they did, right? So it matters what your roots are. It matters where your starting point is. It matters where you're coming from. And so what does he say? What does he say about it? He says, in conclusion, pay no heed to the false and foolish assertion that every religion is good, that every system of beliefs can lead to heaven. It's like, it's like the privileged path, right? <laughs> Reject that nonsense, man. Get rid of that. That's got to bounce. And did he make up for that, by the way? Did he make up for that? Was there like a redo where he got to go on another show and talk to somebody who wasn't, you know, able to throw the, you know, the particular thing that happened that I don't want to use the word, but it has to do with, you know, offerings and fire and stuff. I don't want the YouTube algorithm to come at me. I'd be like, look, 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 look I'm saying. You know, because he's talking to old Ben Shapiro. And he's probably a little bit worried about, you know, if I tell this guy he's going to the fire, you know, stuff might come up about that. <laughs> so he might, maybe he's worried. Trying to give him the benefit of the doubt the best I can. <laughs> it's garbage. But still, right? Still. He talks about a, a pious mistress. Had a servant who very often talked this way about religious indifference, right? The first time her wages were due, the lady paid her in base coin or money, which had been withdrawn from circulation. The girl objected, but her mistress replied, but it's money just the same. And don't you think all money is equally good? She then counted out genuine coins, saying as she did so, just as false money will not serve your purpose, so a false creed will never take you to heaven. You know, I, I remember a tactic like that, right? Uh, by the way, yeah, or why even trust your senses? Trendy in the comments says, or why even trust your senses? Yeah, well, if, if, if a worldview matters to that, people, people should not be allowed to walk to the table and just say, please ignore all of my assumptions and my worldview back here. Please ignore what I say about reality, about ontology, about teleology, about epistemology, all of the ologies and isms we can think about. Don't worry about all that stuff. Don't worry about the incoherency of this, the sinking sand back here. Just take my arguments, which, by the way, to even make those arguments in the first place, to have a world, because the world needs to be a certain way in order for there to be even, even something known as absurdity. Even something known as absurdity would require certain conditions in the world. And in fact, that the vast majority of those conditions would not be absurd. That, they would, that there would be a rhythm and a rhyme. That it would not be chaotic. But how does your world that way? How, according to their belief system, how can they even explain how, how um, one person and another person, two different beings, share a sense with symbols, right? Sights and sounds, internal thoughts and feelings that they're able to communicate effectively that we're just similar enough that we can do that and yet different enough that we're different people because they have to be able to explain the one and the many they have to be able to explain how are we not all one like the, the hippies are like hey man we're like all oh, one bro and then you just like kick them right in the you know the jewels and stuff and then they know that they're not all one with you. <laughs> it becomes very quick. <laughs> Snap judgment. Oh, kind of thing. They know you guys ain't the same person. 
You know, and you're like, oh, you're Hitler. And they're like, what? Oh, no. So they know they ain't won. That's phony balloon sauce, man. That is phone balloon sauce. And, and or that everything is different. That's the diversocrat cult. The diversophiles. That's their cult. Everything's so reductionistic, everything is different. Everything's atomistic. In that way, you say, well, you know, what's the commonality? Where do you bridge the gap? And you say, and they say, well, what about you? And I say, I'm a Trinitarian. In the Athanasian sense. Nicene's, <laughs> the Nicene way, the Catholic way to understand the balance of those one and the many that at the same that can be at the same time different and yet not completely different so they're not three different gods and yet one and yet remain three persons bada boom bada bing and because we believe we believe before the question even arose we believe that this world reflects that which is why we can distinguish between one thing and another and yet find similarities between one thing and another, and that these do not absorb or annihilate each other. Secular worldviews cannot, cannot do that. Non-Trinitarian worldviews, no way. You know, and some of it's just a simple reductio, right? And I don't mean to get too technical. I, I said this was for everyday people. I'm the one going off. I'm not the parish priest, and I should have stayed on my notes. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. It's my bad. And we don't even have to think about how ruinous, in fact, it has been. How ruinous, in fact, has it been that, that indifferentism has has swept through our society. It was always there. In fact, I, I would dare say, I would dare say this. I would say that the 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 way the spark that really got it cranking in the West, right? Protestant Revolution. Because they had to for their own survival. Otherwise they were gonna fall prey to the same thing that the early Protestant reformers did. And that was, you know, to all of the Anabaptists and such. Which they did, by the way. They did. Protestants were dead on arrival. <laughs> I heard that somewhere in this like mythological thing that is rumored. It's an urban legend that there used to be a thumbnail of uh, your boy <laughs> with something that said Protestants dead on arrival. Watch Protestants eat themselves alive. I promise it had nothing to do with, you know, the grand poobah over at me and Catholic thinking that was a little too far. <laughs> and then I needed to stick with the solo thumbnail. Oh, the, the solo one, you know. <laughs> uh, but Protestants, the idea, they had to embrace other groups. It really, it's, it's really a tension for them. Whenever, whenever they have to come against an enthusiastic group, that's a tough deal for them. That's not easy. Because it cuts at their system. Even, even fellow heretics, it's grown... It's through its through its arbitrary uh, uh, use and practice. It's faith and practice. It's arbitrary faith and practice. It has developed over the years in such a way that now, as long as you fit certain key descriptors like Trinitarianism and you believe in their their canon of scripture, that's basically it. And and other things, you know, each one of those things, by the way, is at least in its origin is found as authoritatively declared. You know by the Catholic Church. Because <laughs> they have no authority on their own. Zero. Zero. But we see it's taken over in the West like crazy. Indifferentism. Look at what it's done to families. Look at what it's done to, to families and to children and to schools, to societies, to businesses, to practically everything in life. And Father Lassant spends an enormous amount of time, in fact, and I, I was delighted to see this, an enormous amount of time talking about literature and saying, one, and now remember, he was, he was at a time, he was at a time of, of uh, typographical mind was dominant. 
Okay, so he was at a time when most folks are just they're reading books or newspapers or periodicals or whatever. They didn't have, you know, they weren't sitting around watching a bunch of TV with each other. Uh, the radio w- would be coming in, right, at some point. But that was even still a communal thing. Most of the time, that was something that families would have in their family room. There's a big radio. Have any of you ever owned one of those? Have any of you ever owned one? Where, where it's one of those big old timer radios, you know? We used to. Big wood one. You know, with that kind of that kind of felty screen, you know, almost like a almost like basket weaving, <laughs> like a kind of a kind of a basket weaving, like a straw feel or something. I don't know. You know, it kind of had that mesh that was over top of the speaker and stuff. And you had the big knobs, you're turning the knobs and all that. That was kind of around at the time, but that was still, I mean, you're, it's an investment for the family. And most of the time you would sit around, you'd play games and such. But most people were typographically minded and, and the, the radio was still oral. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're still part of the oral tradition. So that's, I mean, that's deeply rooted. But he talks about all kinds of literature. You know, well, what are these people reading? You know, the people that are, that are believing in indifferentism, what are they reading? They're not reading Catholic newspapers or periodicals. They're not found on their tables. Or if, it, it, well, at the time they weren't. Now, maybe they've got themselves an American mag. What do you, you know? How many websites, by the way, just repugnant, just repugnant, blasphemous, heretical sites? How ruinous in respect to the church and to society. There are thousands of mixed marriages. Children born of these unions ought, to course, ought, of course, to be baptized as Catholics, instead of which an immense proportion of them are lost to the church. He talks about society at large. And saying that religion is rightly considered to be, oh, hold on, to be the bulwark of the state. But indifferentism cannot be looked upon as a power of good in respect to society. Since it's not founded upon the fear of God, attention to the voice of conscience and so on. There is but one true church of Christ, but one true faith, but one true religion. So how does he conclude this part? How does he conclude this part? Because he's talking about, so far he's talking about the authority of the church. He's talking about indifferentism. He's talking about indifferentism and saying, you know, what do we do in a world like that? How do we protect ourselves? The centrality of prayer. We talked about that already. He says, to conclude, do not seek a quarrel with other people who are not of your faith. That's why I'm saying people are going to get mad about this. People are going to get mad and say, what are you talking about? How else are we going to bring them in? That right there is betraying. Your modernism is showing, in fact. Your modernism is showing if you talk that way. You really have bought into this idea that, that, you know, the people who come in, it's through the strength of my argument. You're a good rationalist, that's for sure. That's not very trad, that's for sure. Where's the role of prayer in that? Where's the role of engaging with real people in real time? Where's the role of you providing a good example? Why is the emphasis always, I need to get on my keyboard right now, and I need to just start click-clacking away. I need to spread it all out there. Where where do you get the idea that the debate is going to end with you? It ain't ending with me. It's not ending with Tim Flanders. It's not ending... With Taylor Marshall, it's not ending with with Gordon. It's not ending with Lofton. It's not ending with Han or Keith. It's not ending with any of them. It didn't end. It didn't end with any of the great saints that lived during these times. It didn't end the debate. They keep coming. And why? Because we die. Because we die. And more come. And people are pretty dumb. <laughs> people, are, people are pretty dumb. They haven't learned from the past. And because of sin, because of sin, it's not just the brain. He says here, but if they attack your church or your faith, key. Now, I, I would say he is living without the social imaginary that we have, okay? 
Technological advancement made it so that if you want to find somebody attacking the church, it's an easy thing for you to do. I think a lot of people are adrenaline junkies that go on social media because they need to get their, you know, the jollies going. They need that dopamine hit. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that person blaspheming. Oh, yeah, man, I'm on now. It's on like Donkey Kong. Watch this. Have you ever heard of the unmoved mover? <laughs> Stop. Stop. Therefore, in such case, do not say, right? He said, because to remain indifferent. Now, that's the thing. Do you remain indifferent? Or do you take it on like Donkey Kong? Is, it, is that the only either or? Do you pray for that person, by the way? Or are you just another rando, a blurry squiggle on a screen? Is that what we are? Have we been reduced to squiggles on a screen? A glowing beam of light from a profile picture and a cheap character limited bio. Is that what we are? Is that what God has been boiled down to? Do we feel just like the atheist in the eminent frame that we need to be dealing with everything right now? It's my responsibility. I'm the one. I got to go right now. I got to shake this person out. Or is it your responsibility to get on your knees and pray for them and to pray for yourself? Because in all likelihood, if you're on that platform, you've probably opened yourself to enormous pressures. And it might be hubris for you, in fact, to believe that it's of none effect. Therefore, in such cases, do not say, all right, let's talk about this some other time. But rather quote the saying in vogue among the heathen tribe, slay me, but spare my mother. Kill me, but don't talk trash to my, to my mom. Don't you love that, by the way? How often have you said that? How often have you said it and left it at that? Rather than just as an invitation to be like, oh, well, I, I need to debate these people all night long. There's a great meme. <laughs> Somebody shared it in the chat, I think, talking about, you know, uh, my opponent. No, 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 it was on uh, It was on, on my buddy, Peter Michael Burke Jr., right? President of League of Christ Sovereign. It was on his page, the Facebook page for uh, SpongeBob Memes with Catholic Themes. And it has a, a picture of, of Squidward and he's on the side in the bed, right? And he's like all panicked. <laughs> and he's looking and SpongeBob is peeking through. Right, the little the little window. He's got his arm reaching up, and it says, "My opponent that I've debated all day, trying to get to sleep, and me wanting to continue the argument at four in the morning." Right, something. It was obviously worded, you know, a little better than that. <laughs> that make a terrible meme. It was a good meme, you know. But but how often do we do that? How often do we leave it at that and say, "Spare me, but you know, slay me, but spare my mother." How often do we leave it at? saying that and then committing to say, I'm actually going to do like Leonard did for Jeremiah and pray for seven years, seven years, every day by name for that person. Or is it just a flash in a pan? Is that person's soul a flash in a pan? Is that all it is? Is it just another, another picture in the, in the drive-by? Is it, is it like driving down a road in a terribly overcrowded city? a terribly overcrowded street with signs all over the place. And there are so many signs, so many signs everywhere you look that you can't even tell anymore until it's literally right in your face. And then by the time you're biting, you look in the rear view, it's already smothered by all the other signs. Is that how it works? Is that who people are? Right here. We're going to skip over that. All right here. In these days when faith has either grown cold or been lost altogether, in so many instances, there are persons, and among their number, girls of 18 or 20, when they're exhorted to reflect upon death and eternity, that they merely reply, I am no child to be frightened by nursery tales. Who knows whether everything goes uh, does not end at death? And it's what he talks about being 
being terrified by that. And how most of them are ignorant anyway. Most of them would not be able, and that's from the girl's guide, that they would not be able. So, so just so you know, I'm mixing these two together. So if there's a little bit of, if it's a little bit funky sometimes and I'm skipping over stuff, it's because I'm trying to blend the two together. Sometimes he will include the same paragraphs, right? And similar flows for both, but he has unique portions as well. And so, but I want to just inform people, you know, the, the women's guide, that guide has a method, not only on personal apologetics, but even in debate, even in confronting women in your life. And those women end up acting in that way and talking about maybe there's no God or talking about maybe there's no heaven and instructing you. I think the method, the emphasis of, of the, the, the um, method that he uses, I believe is currently presently insufficient. I believe it's insufficient. I think that that debate has gone on long enough that, that look, not, uh, unbelievers, they adapt. <laughs> they adapt. Sin is a heck of a drug. Vice is a heck of a drug. And they'll learn clever little tricks. They'll learn clever, clever little tricks. And it's not, not, not that it's, not that it is, again, not that the argument itself is not true, but that it's, em it's emphasis, it's placement in the apologetic stack is not appropriate, right? I don't think it's fitting for the situation we found ourselves in at our present time in this secular age. And he says, we have to ask ourselves, right? Who, uh, who are we in the image of? So he goes back again. He goes back to the person. He's not, he's not just throwing us headlong into a bunch of these arguments. He's throwing us back to the people that we're engaging with. And he's using arguments, of course, like, well, I, you know, a person who says they don't believe in a soul because you can't see it. And he says, well, you know, he asks him a question. And he, the guy says, you know, he's th thinking about it for a couple minutes. And he goes, have you thought about it? And the guy goes, yeah, I thought about it. And he says, well, I don't, I don't believe you thought about it. Well, why? Because I, I didn't see your thoughts. <laughs> They're invisible to me. Again, it's a little outdated. It's a little outdated because people will bring up, you know, MRI stuff. You know, those, the uh, what is it, live MRIs? Where they put you inside a machine and you can see the way that the, the parts of the brain are snapping off. Bam, 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 bam. Electricity shooting all over the place. They can predict the different parts of the brain now that say, this is where this happens and this is where this happens. They can't find the source where it all begins. They're kind of stuck in this place. Which is why so many of the scientific people end up falling into a crazy quagmire where they've got cognitive dissonance through the roof pouring out of their ears and nose uh, talking about how unable to figure out the balance of what is natural and what is nurture, what is internal by instinct and nature and what is environmental and societal. That's why. Because they can't balance that one and many. <laughs> We're back to the one and many. They, they can't do it. They can't do it. They don't know how to figure it out. And they're lost in that balance. And they have no concept of mystery. In fact, they loathe it. He's talking about the, the, the immortality of the soul, saying, what, what's the reason? How do, what drives us? What drives us? What drives us to do what we do? when we're dealing with people and we're in conversations and we're debating and such. What are the first thoughts that we have? What, what have I said? What have I, what, on, on enthusiasm, what did I say? What did I say? It's about the new evangelization. And in some cases, the new re-evangelization. The Salesian method. <laughs> right? It's the new evangelization. It is about recognizing the age we're in. But I believe that that evangelization begins with ourselves. And that's one of the criticisms a lot of people have. Is they go, well, the emphasis isn't so much on these traditional arguments. And I like to go out and rah-rah. I like to, to fight that person with arguments until the break of dawn. And say, how many arguments have you been in, by the way? And is your goal to, to make sure that you are settled on that? Or is your, is your goal to convert that person by arguing their way into heaven. What is, what is it? Because if it's, if it's you being settled on the debate, then maybe you shouldn't be getting into such a debate with this person. 
or play against a robot or something. I don't know. You know, do something different than that. Because you're not opening yourself up for all sorts of, of problems. If it's to reason that person into heaven, you might want to reconsider a different path. If for no other reason than if you if you put a checklist up and you say, uh, how many debates have I been in where I've gotten into arguments that have consumed my my time, that I'm anxious about it, and everything else? How many of those people converted because of me? You know, and may, look, maybe you can you can make the excuse and say maybe it was like the smallest little bit that helped, and maybe down the road you never know. I might meet a lot of people that were like, oh, you're that random guy on Twitter. Oh, if it wasn't for you, I'd never come to the church. <laughs> and you're like, I knew it. I knew that was my apostolate, Lord. <laughs> I knew what you made me to do. You made me to be a rando Annan. Yeah. Let's see. I got people in the in the comments talking about Guy Fox. Well, Guy Fox, man. Well, yeah, today is the fifth of November, isn't it? <laughs> that's that's the priority. I mean, I mean to be rude or anything. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, I mean, it's it's a thing. It's a thing. Let's see. And talking about the meaninglessness of life. And th this is a practical thing, right? This is, we've talked about, you know, I've, I, I huh, went down a crazy path that I shouldn't have done. I went down a crazy path, was throwing out allergies and isms. There's no reason, right? We're, we're trying to focus on a parish priest and his practical counsel for personal apologetics, right? And, and interpersonal apologetics. Um, but he, was, he talks about, you know, death. You know, can love and friendship be mere empty words, can virtue and justice be a delusion? You know, that, those arguments don't sound so lofty. Those are arguments that maybe like a second grader can make. But those are the arguments that stick. Those are the arguments that when people get older, you know, he, he brings up something. He says, there, there's a lot of people who find Catholicism on the deathbed, and that's well and good. You know, it's, it's, it's risky business to do. You know, risky business not only to wait that long, but risky business because of the intention of your heart. Where, where are you at on that? St. Alphonse is pretty critical of it, by the way. But he also goes and says, how few people reject Catholicism on their deathbed? <laughs> how many people are rejecting it? And saying, you know what? I'm going to take this opportunity to reject my faith. <laughs> how many people? But he says, we're all looking for happiness. We're trying to find what makes you happy? It's like that Sheryl Crow song. People got mad about it. The truth is that's actually true. They're trying, you're trying to find whatever makes you happy. In the lesson, it's one of these things that the lesson's actually been taught us a long time ago, right? I mean, it, it didn't it? St. Augustine, thou didst make us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart can find no rest until it rests in thee. Until it rests in God. And it's, uh, Lassan says, this is indeed a true saying, for our hearts can find no permanent satisfaction, no lasting content in temporal possessions, in health, friendship, honor, pleasure, and renown. I like that quote, but I'm going to skip it. <laughs> I that go, but I'm going to skip it because we only got we we don't have tons of time left. And by the way, if you if you enjoy the show, make sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this real quick. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play that that video. We got to go back to the main scene here. We got to go back to the main scene. I want to play one more time the Saint Maker, uh, just to let everybody know. Say, look, you got to pick up your Saint Maker because we're moving on to a, a separate section in in the book. And so I figured, well, we'll go ahead and do that. I can fill up my coffee. I'm almost out of this beer. I got to tell you, this is delicious for a lager, right? For a lager. And I'm not the biggest fan. So, you know, if, if people like lagers, I'm not normally the guy that you would talk to. But if I don't go drink and go, 
and kind of like spit it back in, like trying to not. I wouldn't be mean about it. I wouldn't be like drinking. And go, but if I if I drink it and you don't see me go do that kind of number of trying to be nice about it, then it's probably pretty decent. And this one has got me going, mm, man. <laughs> and I'm kind of bummed because it's running at the bottom and I, I, I can only have one a day. I've heard of the show and only on the days of the show. Which, of course, as a reminder, quick PSA, next Monday, this upcoming Monday, I'm going to be on 10 to noon over at Reason and Theology, the channel that is head up there by an amazing guy, Michael Lofton. Loving getting to know him. And excited, honored, in fact, to be getting involved with his channel and the Apostle over there. Very, very grateful for all of that. So we're going to do a quick promo for the Saint Maker, and we'll be right back with more of our coverage and our series and our conversation. I'll, I'll even try to get into the some of the chats. By the way, let me say this real quick before we do. <laughs> I say it all the time. If you want, if you want your question to be read aloud, because right now, if I go down and I'm looking at it, you got a whole bunch of comments in there. But if you want if you want the questions to be mentioned or comments to be mentioned on air, just tag paleocrat or, or meaning of Catholic because I'm 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 uh, put on here as meaning of Catholic right now. Put on meaning of Catholic. I can see it at that point. I will see the highlight right of the of the. It will stand out right. It'll be set apart. It'll be made holy. <laughs> so it'll be set apart above the rest. A cut above cream of the crop kind of thing. And so make sure if you want if you want that if you've had a question thus far. And I don't care where it goes, right? I mean, I don't go, you know, too far off base, right? But if you, you know, try to stick to the themes of stuff. But if you post a comment, I will try to to do that. So post your comment now. We're going to do a quick uh, Saint Maker promo, and we'll be right back. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself. But in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife, Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though, so head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. Patty says he got paid and he's buying this. Make sure go to thesaintmaker.com slash paleocratdiaries.com. It's going to bum people out because I didn't go to the music. Uh, it's part two. I, maybe I should. Should I do that? Should I do that real quick? <laughs> we'll, we'll play it in the background for a minute. Not not for not for too long though. Not for too long. Oh no, that's not it. That's the Kaiser intro. <laughs> no, no. Where where did I go? Where did I go? Where did I go? Ah, there I am. <laughs> I'm all I'm all sorts of messed up. It's Kreuzberg, Kreuzberg, not Kaiser. That was my Kaiser intro. Here we go. So we got to play some of this music here. And there we are. So we're back with part two. We're down to the last 15, 15 minutes. How's this part two? I'm terribly timed. <laughs> we're down to the wire, folks. We're down to the wire. So make sure, put your comments in the, the live chat there. And make sure, please, put, if, you, if you're if you directing it to us over here, if you're directing it to Meaning of Catholic, make sure to mention at Meaning of Catholic. It should pop up in the bar there. Mention it to us. We'll scroll through, see which ones stand out. And we'll try to reply to those. We've talked about apologetics of the heart. We've made criticisms of apologetic methods and emphases that may have outlived their utility in our secular age. Not, not, that, they're in, not that they're of no use, but that their placement in the stack is not uh, sufficient. It's not efficient or sufficient for the modern age, for dealing with people who in mass have fallen away into the, the cesspool of a secular eminent frame. Talked about that. We talked about brewing. 
talked about coffee. We've talked about the Wolfpack chat. Any of the, th- the centrality of prayer, right? The, the interpersonal dialogue, cl- clacktivism, and what's wrong with it. So if you have any questions whatsoever, make sure to go ahead and put those in the comment section. For example, Mike Joe, how are you doing, my guy? Dude, I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm doing, how does it sound, man? How does it sound like I'm doing? I'm like, the, you know, I'm feeling good most of the time. Most of the time, you know, feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good right now because I'm drinking and I will, I will answer. I saw Jake Fowler did already. Jake Fowler is also, as well as David Haleva, a, a, an admin now. They are a contributor at the Paleocrat, at Paleocrat on uh, Telegram. So you're going to begin seeing posts from them right there on the main page, not having to share anymore from them, not having to share from the group. They're right in there. And I'm going to be setting up a contributor page for them. If you'd like to be a contributor, make sure, of course, paleocratdiaries at gmail.com or even better, just go to Telegram. Stop the Gmail nonsense. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) New World Order stuff. I don't want it. I don't need it. Been there. Done that. I'm sick of it. And now it's just just a, a garbage pile. To be honest, isn't it? Don't you hate even after the login? You're like, oh, Gmail is right. <laughs> you know they have that Freemason symbol anyway. <laughs> like, I need to get out of there. So go to Telegram. You got to do it. All right, we're going to the main stage. Very good. Um, but to answer the question, another one uh, put uh, put out there by Patty asking, uh, what's the beer brewery? The beer brewery is the Tridentine Brewing. Okay, and that actually I have it here. This what I'm drinking today. I'll show you the the picture one more time. Okay. I'm drinking this. Now they didn't get that label on it. Look at how dope that is. Look at how dope that is. What a what an amazing group of guys. I'm drinking the Hofburg Vienna Lager is what I'm drinking at the moment. Oh yeah, they got a bigger one. I gotta I gotta get frames for some of these things, right? I gotta get look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous? They're just amazing. Look at the colors. Just just amazing. And and they wanted the shape to be like the the miraculous metals and stuff, right? And so, yes, very, very, very good. Of course, I've got this. I showed this earlier. It's the Magnet, right? This is Tridentine Brewing Company. It's a family business. Uh, they're not selling it. They're not selling it yet, but they're kind of, you know, doing one of these things, putting the finger up in the sky, seeing which way the winds are blowing. And if it's any, if it's any indication, wasn't the reaction at the Wolf Pack, wasn't that just amazing to them, he rolled in and just a whole bunch of people. You know, it's like one of those things. It kind of let me down a little bit. Because <laughs> we've had people come on that talked about prayer. We had people that come on that talked about preparation for mass. We have people that come on that talked about the the uh, Legion, the, the League of Christ Sovereign, right? So we've got people to come on talking about the League of Christ Sovereign and all these other things and converting, right, from Calvinism, converting to Catholicism and that. And, and to to have them come on, and there were decent questions, but then the beer group comes on, and everybody goes nuts! I'm like, what are you guys, Catholic? <laughs> What's going on with all of you? And if you want to know more about that, you have to go check it out. You absolutely have to. I wonder if I've got it set up here for Telegram. Oh, yeah, I do. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, just, oh, yeah, so since I've been on, the book club has 48 comments on it. That's the book club of the Canine Brigade. Paleocrat Wolfpack Chat is 27. Some of the folks here are in the comment section. The Wolfpack Prayer Chain. People people do pretty good in that prayer chain about sticking to prayer. It, does, it doesn't end up being all over the place. The Wolfpack Resources. Right, that Alpha Pack? That Alpha Pack is a, is a secret. I need to... <laughs> you guys didn't know about that. <laughs> the Alpha Pack. You're like, I knew it! I knew there was a secret. Oh, and look at this. Timothy Flanders. Timothy Flanders is in there. What, what, what is he answering here? From what I can tell, the manual of indulgences does not explicitly address that. A question, okay. But this implies that you can do both with one holy communion. When in doubt, get permission from a priest. Yeah, and Pax Domini right there says clutch. Thanks, T. <laughs> totally. So yeah, you can see it's it's super dope. It's super fun, right? And you, you can see here, if you scroll down, check it out. So it's got the members. It's got the media, right? So it's got all the different videos and pictures that we've shared. It's got the files, right, that we've shared. So there's a bunch of different files, PDFs and everything else. All the links that we have shared. So any link that's gone on there. And this, I love this. I listen to this all the time. This is, these are MP3s that have been shared on, on the site. And this is a playlist. You can play any song you want. And you can put it on repeat. You can put it on, I think, shuffle. 
You might be able to do shuffle. I don't know. And then you got voice. These are little videos that you can do. Let me see if it shows up here. Yes, dude. I got to make a bop. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that that was uh, going through there. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. See, so, yeah, you, you can. Okay, well, you could at least hear it. You could at least hear that. Let's see. Yeah. It probably isn't. You know, I, I've looked. I... So you can make videos. You can make videos in each one of these down here. Videos, audios, everything else. And, of course, all the GIFs that have been shared and that we use, and you can download all them. All of that is connected just with this. And that's true. That's true for any of these. In fact, I'm going to watch this one right here, right? Is nude art bad with Jonathan Pajot, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to watch that. A friend sent it to me. I want to hear what he has to say about that. He was on with, what is it, Pints with Aquinas? Is that what that was? Is that what that was? Yeah, Pints with Aquinas. Yeah. So, okay, so that, that's in there. And, and everything that I share there ends up going to the Wolfpack channel. And you can see Anthony's typing. Look at that. Anthony's typing. So you can see who's typing. You can respond to all the different people. It's like the live chat in YouTube, but even better. Even better. And it doesn't sleep. <laughs> it does not sleep, man. Let's see, Mikey Joe said, will you tap into the Wolfpack hive mind to make shorts, or will that be a lone wolf endeavor? Bro, I am tapping into the live mind 24-7, dude. <laughs> tapping into the hive mind. You let me know of different shorts, I will put it on the long list because <laughs> there will be there will be multiple, I believe, suggestions. But I'm I'm definitely open. I mean, in fact, it really helps, man. It really helps. So okay, we got to keep cranking this out. We got to keep cranking this out. All right. So right here it says if if there are persons to whom you cannot speak in this way, talking about you know uh, if somebody is blaspheming in front of you. And so you're on you're online, and and you know this person is is saying wickedly terrible things and trying to get you to to fall away from the faith, which is the endeavor. This is the goal. They're not out there just trying to be you know uh, you know kind of witty and stuff. They their sinful side of them has taken over. Their vices, their sensu their their sensuality has taken over. What they do in private has now become public, and it's being uttered through the megaphones of their mouths. Okay, their minds are, are now no longer muted. It's no longer muted in the mind. It is now reverberating through the megaphones of the mouth. That's what's happening. And they want to take you down with them. They don't want to be alone. If they're persons to whom you cannot speak this way, observe an expressive silence. So what does he say? Fight harder. Make more tweets. <laughs> does he say that? Or does he tell you instead to show an expressive silence? and thus to show your displeasure or adroitly turn the conversation to a different subject. He talks about it. There's a Capuchin monk, you know, that he, he says is able to do, <laughs> do things that are, that are witty. And he gives an example of that. And he says there's room for that too. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're left with things like this, right? We're left with, with the, the dread of death is sin, this never-ending woe. And we can see this in, in other people. We can see this even in ourselves. It's interesting when, when um, you know, when I was an unbeliever, I had friends. In fact, my, my old co-host, and I, he's a good guy, an otherwise decent guy, you know. I care about him. He's a friend. We haven't talked in a long time. But, you know, it's one of those things where to him, it all came down to religion. The reason for religion was the fear of death. But I don't think, you know, and I, I, I don't want to impose on him what his beliefs are regarding, you know, the the zoinky zoink, you know, pick, <laughs> prick punk <poke> thing <laughs> that I don't want to say the words that I don't want YouTube <laughs> algorithms to be all over me. <laughs> say, so, you know what I'm talking about, uh, you know, because <coughs> thing and all that. And so, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I don't I don't know what his I don't know what his take is on all of that. But so many people that share that worldview, that overall general secular worldview, the atheistic mindset, so many of them are completely wrapped up in, in not just a fear of death, but where it is taken on glaringly cultic proportion, where they'll come up to you in public. You don't have how many Catholic people walk up to other folks and say, dude, um, you know what? I think you're like royally scandalous right now. You're wearing an outfit that is not very, um, it's not pleasing the Lord. The Lord is frowning on you right now. How often does that happen compared to how often people come up and go, 
Why aren't you wearing your <coughs> covering? The <coughs> and you're doing <coughs> all over us. I bet you're the same person who hasn't gotten that zoing zoink. Because they're terrified of death. It's why they want to download their brain. They want to download it into the machine and be a robot. They're like, it's, it's still me. I was a robot before. I don't mind if I got metal parts. Totally lying. But we have to be able to express this, not, not just through, you know, arguments that say, oh, look, premise to conclusion. Don't you understand my syllogism? It works. Instead, we have to have things like silence and prayer. We need to be guarded and, and to be trained in a way that is upright. And we'll talk next time. We're going to talk about reading. I meant to talk about it today, but he says so much about reading that it, it deserves its own thing. So we're going to talk about what books should you avoid? What books should you emphasize? Should it be just books? What should, what should you do when you're listening to homilies, for example? Should you seek out homilies and instruction in that way? And what do we do in a day and age where you can watch those things online? People can watch this. I hope that this is uplifting, by the way. I hope that it's informative. I hope that it I hope that you feel equipped. Especially, especially and listen, I want to talk to the, the regular folks, the, the folks that just, you know, they're they feel average. Maybe they feel like they they aren't very important. And I want to say, your life is extraordinarily important. You are made in God's image. That's actually what he starts with. He says we have to understand what image we are in whose image we are in. Because if we understand that, we will understand, like St. Teresa of Avila talks about, if we understood the beauty of the soul and what the soul is, if we understood it, you know, we would be terrified, in fact, of sin. We'd be terrified of, of marring it with the stain of sin, muddying it all up. And so if we, if we understand who we are, then we have to realize that we're important. We have to realize we were made with intention. You know, I, 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 I don't want to get into too much information, but I will say this. I was like 10 years old, and I, I remember looking at a calendar, right? And Or maybe I was younger than that. I might have been like, you know, eight years old or something. But I, I looked at a calendar, and I saw that my parents' anniversary was only a couple months before my birthday. So, they, you know, their ninth anniversary was like three months or whatever, before my ninth birthday. And I remember asking them if I was a preemie. I didn't understand. I was too young to really even understand how long that was. And I, I obviously was not paying much attention to the calendar and counting it down. But I noticed that it was close enough that it stood out. And I learned that it was not intentional. I was not intentionally conceived. And I remember how that affected me. It made me feel like I wasn't important, you know, because I, I, I didn't understand that it's God who gives life and it's God who takes it away. And once I understood that more, I realized that even if my family, even if my mom and dad, even if it wasn't their, their intention, they weren't trying to. In fact, they were trying to avoid it. They were trying to avoid it. But God wasn't. God wasn't. And in fact, that's part of the story that God gave me in life, right? That he foresaw this thing. He knew it was coming. He allowed it. Didn't mean he, he didn't mean he liked it. He wasn't sitting there, you know, saying, hey, look, you guys do, do this naughty deed. That'd be a false understanding of the will of God or of his providence. But to say it's okay. And I only bring that up to say, sometimes people feel especially if they're everyday folks and they're like, you know, doing the grind, right? They're, they're working nine to five or even earlier, you know, they're working, you know, they're working crazy hours, waking up before dawn, getting out the door, barely, barely with enough time to give their wife and kids a kiss or whatever and, and run out the door. And they're dog tired when they get home. Maybe they didn't go to college. Maybe they didn't do any of that stuff, but they enjoy reading books. They enjoy praying, they enjoy going to church. You know, and, and they enjoy watching shows. 
they laugh and, and wonder, you know, how does Jeremiah act that way? <laughs> how does he act crazy? You know, how, how is he so zany? And then, you know, like moments like this where it's just heart to heart. I mean, I, I want you to hear me and I want you to really know that you're important, that you are specially made, that you are made for a time like this. God has a great plan for you and you never know who you're going to deal with in life. You never know. And so when God puts people in your lives and you're doing your best, let's say you're, you're, you're doing your best to love him and to serve him in this life and in the next, and you're doing your best and, and someone comes into your life and, you know, maybe, you, maybe you've dealt with this. You can kind of sense it, right? Where there's, you know, some, something special about a person, something special about um, an encounter. Do you commit yourself to that moment? And you realize that, that moment really does matter. The way you act in that moment matters. And you may have a really good argument, you know, and maybe that argument will help them. But more than all of that, you will help them. It may be an argument that you provided. It might be a smile that you provided. It might be food that you provided when they were hungry or when they were a family accident and they needed help. It might be just simply stopping by to say hi. It might be calling them to say, I miss your voice, man. You know, I just want to know how you're doing. It might be sending a letter to them. But it's you. And as you... Your job is to, of course, know your faith, but it is to live it. You're going to live it more. L look around us and see what our church was built on. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. However, however, look around you when you're in church. Look at those stained glass windows and remember, remember the explanations that we have. Remember the explanations that we have because a lot of people, that is, that is the, the air that they breathe as they grow up. They have seen and been, been impacted by those images before they even fully understood what they were, before they even really knew where they were. My children have seen those images, those stained glass windows in our church of the various mysteries, right? So they've seen it. They've seen the stations of the cross. They've seen the crucifix. My son knows it well enough that he can go, my little one, not my youngest, Wolfgang, but Lucian. He can go grab Ambrose's little mass set that he buys with his birthday and Christmas money. He's, he's a saint in the making, right? For real, pray for him. But he'll grab that stuff and he'll set it up. And he, he doesn't even know how to chant, but he'll do it. He's mimicking these things. And why? Because those were, those were things to help individuals largely who didn't know how to read. Maybe you know how to read, in all likelihood you do. We live in an era of great literacy, in fact. At least when it comes to functional literacy, being able to read a newspaper, being able to read a book. We'll talk next time about how maybe they're reading the wrong things, but it's not that they can't read. And yet, in the, very ch in the church's infrastructure itself, there are angels in the, in the architecture. And that's because it's more than just simply a syllogism. It's more than learning a fancy book. It's more than going and getting your master's or your doctorate. Most people won't. It's being willing to learn from those who do, but being able to learn most importantly from the interior life, from those who say that you need to focus on prayer because one thing that every saint will agree on I mean, without any doubt, is the centrality of prayer. And you don't need a doctorate to do that. You don't need a big fancy book to do that. It does help. We're reading one right now. It's not big, but it is fancy. <laughs> it is fancy. We're reading Interior Castle right now in the book club. The Canine Brigade. If you want to follow that, if you want to be part tomorrow at five, we're having a, a voice chat meeting where it'll be there, audio. I might hop on the video and stuff with some other people. And we're going to talk about the first three chapters of the book, Interior Castle, about St. Teresa of Avila. But that's what it's about. That is the emphasis. That is the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that it matters about you 
and you matter to God and you matter to others because God made it this way. And they, they matter to you. It's an interplay of a bunch of yous. Yous and me's. And it's an interplay. It's personal. And that's where it's most effective. So I hope this helps. Don't get disheartened. I'm going to end with this. I, I, I thought I was wanting to go further, right? But it's okay. Son, let no man take away. This is from the men's guide. Son, let no man take away the faith that is thy soul's chief stay. Count it as thy dearest treasure, far beyond earth's wealth or pleasure. You know, my goal in all this, I, I could never one up Father Lassance, <laughs> not even close. But to but to see the wisdom that he had and the and the and the heart he had for everyday folks, he was a parish priest. He dealt with people on the regular in confession. He knew their hearts. He knew the common struggles of men and women, even of children. And he spoke to them and he showed his priority. And his priority of all this is on what authority? And from that authority, the definitions regarding who you are as a living soul, whose image you're made in, the the way that you can trust the act of faith, the role of, of your life and of prayer in your life to guard you, the apologetics of the heart that says, I the apologetics of the soul that says, I've got things all around me and I am going to establish and fortify my faith because it is the soul's chief stay. It is the faith. It's the pearl of great price. I can't let it go. And if I get wrapped up in trying to make arguments for other people, I might actually lose myself. One in the many. A both and. But a proper priority. And then from that, from that, to then be able to say, and maybe hear some arguments, and beginning not with a positive presentation necessarily, but a reductio ad absurdum, to reduce to absurdity anything that would dare to exalt itself against all the aforementioned things. Because we've already reached that point. <laughs> We're not there in neutrality to go, okay, I'm going to ignore everything I just said, the certainty of this, the certitude of this, the pearl of great price, how this is the truth, this is the pillar and foundation of truth. I'm going to leave that bare. I'm going to play a game with the unbeliever. We're going to pretend to be neutral and just hash it out in a neutral world. No way. They're not coming to you, neutral. And how dare you? How dare I do that? We have no right to suspend our beliefs, not, not in any real sense. We don't anyway. But how dare we? So do things right. Do them in order. Do them in order. Recognize the need for beauty. And beauty in the small things, the angels in the architecture, the children gazing up at stained glass windows, the person who doesn't know how to read but has heard the Paternoster enough that they can fiddle with those beads and cry all over the pew in front of them, wear down their knees on a kneeler. Because that, that is apologetics. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. <sighs> and there we go. That's a robust kind. I, I, I don't want to... <laughs> Give me a loss in there. I don't want to deny the significance of more traditional apologetic endeavors. I'm trying to demonstrate priority and stack. The apologetic stack. Just get used to that phrase. The apologetic stack. We're going to talk more about that and the reasons for what I'm saying with this. We're going to talk more about that when we get to reason in theology on Monday. <laughs> Actually, that's what we're going to do. I want to thank you, Andrew. J-Man, you're a gem. The Catholic world needs this message right now. Then share it, bro. I mean it, man. Even if it's streaming from Michigan. Are you from Ohio? Because if so, 
we can't be friends. <laughs> we can't be friends. Where are you from, man? Anyway, uh, question. Is there a discount code for the Saint Maker? I do not believe so. I do not believe so, but you can go. Sometimes it they would want like, you know, you can write something to them and may, they may be able to. You'd have to go to the main site to find that out and then apply that. But I'm not sure. So don't, don't, <laughs> don't get on me about it. But I appreciate it. Tumaka, Jeremiah, you're the best, man. Keep it up. You're the best. You guys are why I'm here, man. My kids, my family, the love of souls, and the recognition that, you know what, man? I needed grace big time. I needed grace big time. I fell away. I walked away hard, didn't I? I was in the muck and the mire. My, the last episode, I talked about that. In fact, there were tears. No tears today, though. Go over to the Wolf Pack. All the description stuff in the description below. All the details. So go check it out. I better see you at the Wolf Pack. <laughs> I better see you. We even have a greeter now, so you better go. Uh, until then, until Monday, next Wednesday, next Friday, never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.